We are about to get in. Yeah. The champ is here. <laughs> That's our champ. <laughs> and as we are now waiting, Mark Fernandez, the owner of, of Collider, is joining us. I'm going to tell you that. I'm here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm okay. planning on it. Uh, planning on not, not, not doing it. Um, so we are just waiting. And as soon as... And here he comes. The former heavyweight champion of the world has just joined us now. Vladimir Klitschko okay. Josh, is here. You, Vladimir, nice to meet you. Uh, please come have, have a seat. Right here. Uh, so Vladimir Klitschko is joining us now, too, guys. Listen, I mean, this is one of the greatest heavyweights to ever fight, and we are we have the pleasure of him joining the show Collider Live here. His new book, Challenge Management, is coming out. And Vladimir, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here. Big fan for a very long time. And when I heard you were coming in, had to take the opportunity, man. Thank you so much for joining us today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah. You're a great promoter. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. If I knew you before, I would have hired you. Um, so thank you for having me. I'm yeah. really excited to be on the show. It's cool to have you, man. So tell me a little bit about the book. So Challenge Management. Um, how long have you been working on it? Well, um, this book came out in German language last year. Okay. And so far, it has been translated in five languages, Ukrainian, Russian. I'm sorry, not Russian. Ukrainian, German, Bulgarian. Um, English yeah. and Japanese so it's a study book yeah. and um, in the foreword Bill McDermott the global CEO of SAP afterwards the best man on the planet regarding challenges Arnold Schwarzenegger yeah so I'm really excited to have those two in in this book as well as um, my life story and my practical theory which uh, by two PhD students now has been researched and they're making out of my practical theory, scientific law. Challenge management is the philosophy. Yeah. Like, I don't have problems in life. So shouldn't you have. But I have challenges in life. Sure. So should you. And you too. Yeah. <laughs> and you too. Yeah. <laughs> and when you, have, when you have challenges, so just the attitude, problems will freeze you, challenges kind of fun to solve sure and uh, I need to say that face your challenge is the the principle of uh, of and method of the challenge management philosophy and it has face so face your challenge basically don't show back to your challenge show your face to your challenge right um, stare down came from boxing right basically you look at each other's face and you facing your challenger who you're gonna face later on in the ring and you never turn back to your challenge and face his four principles, focus, agility, coordination, and endurance. These four principles unite all the people that have made something of their lives, trying to do something in their lives, being creative. And I definitely share those principles with you guys and mm -hmm. with others. As a professional athlete or an athlete for 27 years yeah. that I've been until I retired last year, so I was um, really getting into t the details and uh, understanding how you can be successful for a long time. And it's really complicated, especially the very challenging uh, sport, the sport of boxing. Yeah, well, I'm sure that too, because again, from, from where your career began, because you, you, had, you had the hype on you when, when you started, and it was, you had all these expectations, and everyone was deeming you the next champion, especially during the reign when, when Lennox Lewis was around, and then they were saying, look out for this kid, because here he comes. And, and then there were some ups, there were some downs, and then once you got up, you didn't come down again. So it was, it, during that time, is that a lot of, this is where basically everything that you're just describing here in challenge management, you're essentially writing this book that once you retire, this is, in your young age, it's kind of like your life's work. This is what it seems like. Uh, you're right. Thankfully, there were failures. Failure is not an option. As Jeff Kennedy said, when the rocket shot and uh, people got on, on the moon. So uh, ch you know, failure is not a challenge. Uh, failure is not an option. But you know what? Um, it was slogan on my team, and after facing um, so far my last opponent in my in my professional career, uh, Anthony Joshua, I actually changed this line. Failure with obsession right. is some of the options. It is an option. Right. Because so. when you're really upset, uh, obsessed with, with the target and your goal, and I have faced it at Wembley Stadium when I didn't win the titles that I was obsessed about so much, I didn't feel like I lost. For some reason, my stocks went up. 
Right. And even if fans were looking for a rematch, and when I said I'm retiring, my stock went up a little bit as well. Yeah. And because this retirement was under my terms, not terms of other people, destiny, God forbid, health. So under my terms, I retired, and I've learned after having all the success and in 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 the sport. I just learned something when you're really upset, uh, uh, obsessed about something and you fail, it is an option and it's okay. Look at um, Christopher Columbus. Yeah. He was on the way to India. Failure. Right. Now, you know, uh, we're in North America. Yeah. Mark, sorry. You <laughs> Discovering. You know, and thanks um, to him. So, so when Christian told me you were coming in, I was very excited because I'm a huge boxing fan. And um, I, you know, like... Uh, like a nerd, I, I, I literally watched a bunch of your bouts, you know? And the Anthony Joshua fight in particular, I think it's very interesting and it really typifies what you're trying to talk about uh, because in the fifth and sixth round of that fight, um, and I highly recommend everybody to go out there and try to watch this fight because it is, I learned a lot about life from this fight. Um, Joshua hits you and you go down and then this, and and then you hit him, and he goes down, and it's one of the most epic Rocky style fights you will ever see in your life. But the the way that you were able to bounce back from this young, I believe it was 28, 27 year old kid at the time, and you know you're you're my age, you know, which is you know crazy to think about. Um, but but um, you know the way that you were able to bounce back, and and uh, the way that even Joshua talks about it, he was like. He didn't think that he could see stars, and you composed yourself after the toughest part of that fight and completely flipped it around on him. It's like, what kind of mental discipline does that take? And, and like, what's the simple way for, for us to learn a little bit from that? Because to me, that's so, so, so incredible. I defined it and named it the code. So you have to kind of decoding success in a certain way, and I, and I realized that everything starts in life with the belief. You break the ground with a belief. Sometimes you don't see things, but you believe in them. Like people believe in God. Did they see it? In a certain way, they describe it, yeah, probably, but not really. But belief is so strong that it can do a lot. So you start with a the belief, then you, get, then you get into willpower. Because that's the next step and move you have to do. Willpower gets you closer to your target and your goal. From willpower, you get to motivation. But motivation is great to have. And we know that it's coming and going. Right. We wake up in the morning, we have a cup of tea and cold shower, whatever. We're motivated for the day. And you get up way to reach, than I do. <laughs> to reach our, our goal in life or, or, or of the day, goal of the day. And then after lunch, it goes down. Right. And then it go, comes up a little bit maybe later and before we go to bed, it comes down again. So motivation comes and going. What is really great is discipline. It doesn't matter what. Discipline is like train on the railway. It gets from A to B and no other way. But discipline is kind of tough. You have to be disciplined, but it's just a really tough thing. And eventually, in the final step of this code, habit. So you, when you get... From belief, get to willpower, get to motivation, get disciplined, and then eventually things just going to fall so easy because it's, it's a habit. Watch out, though, for other habits. It works the same way. Right, right. <laughs> Not yeah. the good ones. Yeah. But that's actually what I can show, share with you guys. Um, that's how I act in, in my professional life as a professional pugilist and um, – I had great success and also failures, thank God. And I wouldn't really take them out. And I lost my last fight. Even though I lost that one, as I explained, I didn't feel that I, that I was like... one of the best fights I've ever seen in my life. I was like standing there in the ring as a loser, so I didn't feel that. Um, and it's something that, that I learned through failures more than probably than through success. Yeah, my, my, it's funny because you know, when I was reading a little bit about you, I know that you're a, a really, really good chess player. And... Um, yeah. yeah. No, no, I mean, but he's like like a legit chess player, lasted 32 moves wow. against world champions, yeah. Yeah. so like very, very good chess player. I play chess as well, and my dad used to always beat the crap out of me in chess when I was young. 
And, um, you know, I'd be frustrated because he would always beat me. And he was like, You're, I'm never going to let you beat me until you actually beat me. So that every time you lose, you learn something. You know, so, so I, I totally get what you're saying. The one thing is, like, when you're in that moment and you have to run through this sort of mental discipline, is that something that you have to train before you get into those moments or it, when you're in the moment? And is it experience as well, too? Right, or when you're in the moment, do you also have an exercise to sort of remember this process? I just named um, five steps of the code, and um, you heard them. You know what success is. It's just the repetition and the drills of the trainings, of, of workouts, of in, in sports, or certain habits. So you just repeat it all the time, over and over and over and over and over again. And that's why you're getting better than the others. You cannot be really great at something when you just tried it first time. I mean, maybe it's just going to be like spark and that's it. But to be continuously and sustainably successful, you need to just have those drills. And when you do have them, you realize there is some fine tuning, there is some like micromanagement you get in and you're really trying to do it better. Can you imagine how many times I tried combinations of one, two, left hook, right straight, and whatever, it like seems the same. Or how many tries, a golfer, how many tries, how many, how many, many times a golfer is, 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 is just trying this perfect swing, yeah. mm -hmm. and he swings and swings a billion times, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just almost never perfect, you know, because there's like little things that make the ball fly either good or bad. But it's all combination of the drills that you have. Basically, whatever you do, you have to just keep on going, just repeat things, and all over and over and over again. Even if you know, you think you you got it, you know how it works. Try to do the same thing because is the book out already. The book yeah. is out yeah. on, on Amazon. You can order it, and um, um, so it's it's out there. So uh, this book this book has has a lot of um, insights, and uh, I think then after reading this book, you're probably gonna get it first of all. You will make out of your problems challenges, and you're going to learn how to solve them. Here's the thing. When I hear you talking about how motivational of a speaker in general you are just from this conversation alone, from knowing you and knowing the background of the, the intelligence both you and your brother have, and knowing your passion for the sport of boxing. I listened to Teddy Atlas on, um, on Joe Rogan's podcast not too long ago. And I happen to agree with his thoughts on boxing in general. I'd like to get your thoughts on it to where what I always thought of is like I've been a boxing fan for a long time, but MMA, the structure of what UFC has done in regards to there's the champion, the rankings are that's who's going to fight. Now, with all the organizations in boxing, with the WBC, WBO, IBF, and so on, so on, does boxing need one organization to have? You know, because there's, there's still rumors of corruption and things that are happening in the way the particular, particular with judges. If you look at the, the last fight with Triple G, people were, were, were saying that things were happening with the judges. Does boxing need one organization with one figurehead that can essentially help um, get it, you know, back to prominence to where when you were when you were fighting and, and to where, you know, some of the back in the day with with Hearns and Hagler. And can it get back there? Do you think you're so right about it? And your question is actually has an answer in it. Um, boxing needs to be structured and centralized, not decentralized like some country or countries in this case. So sport of boxing needs to be centralized as, for example, NBA or NFL or any other sports mm -hmm. where you have one structure, uh, FIFA, UFA, like for football, right. NFL, yeah, soccer, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, NFL. So we can go on and on yep. and on. And when you have central structure, it all works as one unit. And when you have all these different sanctioning bodies and then you have promoters and you have managers and they're obviously conflict of interest. And what is really, and I've been learning it through um, boxing, being in boxing for 27 years, I just realized that there are two parts that really is the core of the sport, athletes and fans and they're getting really disrespected. Yeah. So actually the core <laughs> is not getting what it should and supposed to get. Yeah. I think that digitalization is one of the keys to fight corruption you mentioned mm -hmm. and bureaucracy. 
it happens automatically. You digitalize everything, transparency right there. And I believe that every fan should have a chance to vote yeah. as well as a judge. Mm -hmm. Just will it have mm -hmm. some effect on the result or not? It's secondary, but at least like every person needs to see through a mobile device or whatever gadget. It's almost like they do um, with certain so like, shows. You could, yeah, you could voice, not sir. just read some articles, you know, and and people and, and writers, is, or they have their preferences yeah. and their favorites. Um, so you have just this fan base. And when you can see the numbers, who fans voted for, and uh, I think it's going to, in a certain way of digitalization, set an app, um, and it's going to be in a, in a pretty clear understanding how the sport works, how the rules work, um, and especially for the preparation yeah. for athletes, their health. We talk about athletes while they're active. Great, everybody's excited, there's a lot of money in it and all of this. You have managers, promoters, as I said, the sanctioning bodies. But then as soon as the athletes stepping out of the sport, they're gone. Right. And they're facing challenges big time. <laughs> then suddenly they don't have managers and promoters and sanctioning bodies. Nobody's interested in them right. at all. No use so there are a lot them. of yeah. broken yeah. souls yeah. and stories and I believe that such organizations should take care also also of fans and athletes afterwards. Is there a way to unionize? With education, yeah. healthcare, and so on. It should be done. Yeah. Well, do you think that, well, let me ask you two questions here. The first is, do you think that box, boxers, if you get that organized, um, again, like the UFC or NFL, like we went, in, went into it, there's one particular organization. Could we then, could we be able to unionize it and is being involved in anything like that one body? Is that something that you would like to do? We know what you, as far as being able to motivate people, but because of your history, because of the things that you accomplished in the sport, and because you are this respected figure, is running an organization, is being part of an organization, is that something that you'd be interested in doing? I'm definitely supportive um, of the sport. Yeah. I'm a fan, sport of boxing. I'm a former boxer. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, with the amateur organization Zaiba and professional for uh, 20, 21 years. Um, I know the sport and I know the topic, uh, what I'm talking about. So I definitely very supportive how that's going to look like. Everyone can criticize and say things, but if you want to do it better, do it yourself. Right. And I'm definitely standing for it, and uh, I'm supportive of it, and I'm going to support the sport as long as I, as I can, as long as I'm here in this world, because this sport this is a sweet science. Yeah. That's why, you know, I have academic background, because of boxing. So I wrote my PhD about boxing. Oh. And this is method. It's not just a book. It's a study book, and it's a method. And such great companies as SAP and Deutsche Telekom and others using this method in their companies. And it works. Whatever I've learned in the boxing ring and outside of the ring, I methodically, sustainably, systematically put it in this in this method and it works. It works for people that are has been for the past three years at the university in St. Gallen in Switzerland where I teach it's in German language and afterwards getting to Harvard. I just was last week in Harvard and was lecturing and uh, introducing the method for the students in Harvard and it was an amazing experience. Yeah. So there is something definitely, especially this method is going to help also boxing, sport of boxing. And I would love to share it with organizations. Right. Uh, how to function, how to face challenges. But do you think because of the corruption, do you think that th there are enough people that, that will listen? Are there good people like who? Like who are the good people in boxing? Like who are the like the good promoters that you could have these conversations with? Because you always hear again these horror stories of the ones who like you, like could take advantage of the fighters and that, and that that are really looking forward to it because they haven't helped the sport of boxing because there's not a division. There's not. It's, it's a matter of whose fighter. And for perfect examples, a Canelo and Triple G fight. It's apparently, and again, I heard with Rogan and, and Teddy Atlas talking about the judges that they have judging these fights are people who are not that even that experienced watching boxing, and that puts potentially, you know, the fighter's purse at, at stake here, their next fight at stake here. 
So who can you talk to? Who are the good people out there that you can have those conversations with? Like, let's start this. Because I think what, I, what you're saying is where we got to go. But the question is, how do you get them to listen after these hundreds of years of the way these things have been done with the back in the day with the Arams and, and the Don Kings? Like, how do you get it done and make that switch by doing what you were talking about in this book? I believe, um, first of all, I'm not going to name bad people or good people sure. because people that are in boxing and I'm not going to say managers are bad or promoters are bad or sanctioned bodies are bad. They've just been there for for decades, for 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 very long, long time and uh, more than half a century. So basically what they do, they're reflecting the situation, the, the rules that have been kind of very far banned right. and, and still banning in different ways. Forget about, um, forget about, you know, broadcasters and, you know, and, and, and sanctioning bodies and all this. You need to get into amateurs. That's mm -hmm. all goes. That's the ground. That's where you break the ground. You start from the amateurs. And amateur sport is crucially important. Professional boxing would not exist without amateur sport, sure. period. So you need to change and you need to make this change in amateur organization. Yeah. Like, it's very painful to hear that AIBA has been excluded. AIBA is the sanctioning body for the amateurs. Okay. Has been excluded to participate at the next Olympic right. Games in Tokyo right. by the IOC. How is that can happen? What's the, what's the record? Why do they that, say that? Like, it's, it's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. And Olympic boxing because has become... Yeah. I, I, I'm, whatever the reasons are, I mean, there's plenty of articles um, written and done and, and why IOC is not accepting the AIBA as sanctioning body uh, for the amateurs and be, be invited to the, to the Olympic movement mm -hmm. next Olympic Games in Tokyo. So there are plenty of reasons for it. And that must be changed yeah. because, once again, fans and athletes are suffering. I just put in myself in the skin of these kids that are dreaming of going to Olympics in Tokyo and they train, they do anything in their life for the sport That's all and, they do. and for the medals mm -hmm. and just the idea of the about competing at the Olympic Games and, and, and it gets ripped away and win yeah. and win or just participate. And this dream is being taken away yeah. for right now. I hope things are gonna change. Yeah. And um, as I said, if you want to do it better, do it yourself. So I'm just really thinking a lot how I can help to change it. So what, what I have a question because we're talking about challenges. And so I am I agree that I am a fan who is suffering <laughs> because it's, it made me very pissed off. And I'm Mexican. And when I saw the Canelo and Triple G fights, and I saw what you happened. You are not looking like a pissed off fan. Yeah, well, I just wanted well, to. Well, no, I, <laughs> it's very early. Yeah. So, uh, but seeing those two fights back to back and seeing the judge's decision and then seeing what you're talking about with uh, this, you know, Olympi Olympic athletes, how do you or take those types of challenges and failures for somebody that is losing and how do they overcome that when it's kind of out of their control? Like losing who? Like losing? Well, that whether you're losing because a judge made a wrong call, oh, right. or um, or because well, you don't get to go to the Olympics. Well, we we also think in a certain way in stereotypes. You know, if you're a journalist, I might buy you. If you're a politician, you must be a liar. If um, we can go on and on, if you're a boxer, you're dumb. It's just like certain boxes that Very we think, true. stereotypes that mm -hmm. we think of, and. Uh, I believe I believe that um, it's a combination and it's a chain of of evidences and education. So judges need to be educated. Um, fans needs to be they need to be educated. And as I said, digitalization is the only way to fight corruption and bureaucracy, and also get better education. Let's take care of them who takes care of the fans and, and especially uh, boxers, athletes. They're trainers. They need to be educated as well because my PhD work is actually about preparation, how you can prepare tremendously and better um, young kids or teenagers in this case between 14, in the age of 14, 19. So 
if you're not well educated, you're gonna break this female or male boxer just in a period of time with the just getting from a boy to a girl and from, I'm sorry, from a boy to a man and from a girl, you know, to a woman. And like age of 14, if you break them through hard workouts, bad training, and with certain bad behavior, they're not gonna succeed in their lives. So you really need to take care of someone who's taking care of, of the athletes and these trainers, for example. So it's just a chain. It goes on and on and on with managers and sanction bodies and, and promoters. So they all need to be educated. And that's why centralization of the sport is crucially important so that everyone can reflect their action according to the method. That's why this method challenge management, face your challenge is so important to for organizations. So every person has responsibility and understand what is entrepreneurship in entrepreneurship. So the little piece uh, in, in the big one, in big organization. And so understanding that and asking actually themselves, what can I do for this big organization and not this organization can do for me? As mm -hmm. Jeff Kennedy said, this famous line, you know, ask yourself what you can do for the right. country and other way, other way around. And it all starts from that. So you need to break ground with that and everything else just gonna add into it as a chain. Is there a point in your career, is there like, is there a, a punch that you threw or a punch that you took that you remember? Like that, that was like, that was the one. Well, punches that you take, you don't remember. Joshua <laughs> 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 yeah, Jones. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and by the way, you're laughing right now. Don't ask a boxer question that he cannot answer with the words. Right. <laughs> you're, you're really hand reach out of me right now. So I would pay, I would, listen, I, I would can literally reach you with my jab. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to see that. Right. Speaking of, now we go a little lighthearted. I do want to ask you a question, too, because I remember, and correct me if I'm wrong, that you were growing up, you, you and your brother were big fans of the Rocky franchise. Is that, is that, is that accurate? So with Creed um, that had just come out, now Creed 2 coming out, um, the trailers have kind of hit. Uh, were you a fan of the first Creed, and are you looking forward to seeing the second movie? And, and you know, it's it's such a different take on the Rocky franchise, but still kind of brings new energy, in my opinion. But did you see Rocky IV when you were living? Um, yes, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so like, the perception of watching Rocky IV from the other side, that's what we want to know. Oh, that's true, too. That's true, too, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, were you rooting for Drago, or were you rooting for Rocky? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, I know the story well, and uh, I... Like I'm a fan of Rocky, yeah. uh, franchise. I'm a fan, fan of Rocky as a character in the movie. I'm a fan of Rocky. That is actually, is a Rocky, a true Rocky. Mm. Is Sylvester Stallone. Yeah. Um, you know, we had this amazing chance to, to collaborate, and uh, I, I've been co-producer of Rocky musical. Uh, oh, really? I didn't know that. That's oh, wow. awesome. Sylvester yeah. Stallone. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Really want to see that. Believe it or not, it started actually back in Hamburg. That's where we broke the ground with the musical, yeah. and and um, Broadway came over, looked at it, and said, "We want to have it." Oh, it's but awesome. as we know, Broadway is very challenging. So Rocky was running in Broadway over half a year, and then then it closed. But anyway, Rocky musical made to Broadway. So I'm a fan of Rocky and Sylvester Stallone because he's Rocky. Yeah, um, it's it's amazing that Sylvester. Considering even his age, he's so creative. I think he's stuck at 27. Like yeah. The way he acts and, and does things and, you know, communicate. And he's a fantastic guy. And um, I think that a lot of people that have been highly influenced by the Rocky story and motivated as well uh, with just the music yeah. and, and the images that everyone holds in, in, in the mind. And sometimes it's so important for this just one important first step to something. And when you're really getting this type of influence and motivation with the story, you, you definitely you definitely make it. Yeah. You make this first step. And it's so important to move ahead instead of just stay still. When you're staying still, you're falling back automatically. And yeah. rock is actually, rock, rock story is teaching it. I, I have one question that I have to ask, or else I, because uh, I, I've been thinking about this for like, you know, ever since he told me you were coming on the show. Um, there's this beautiful interview that I saw you give where you promised your mom that you and your brother would never fight um, in the ring. You know, I'm sure you guys fought off the ring, but, <laughs> but, but in the ring you would never fight professionally. Did you guys have to turn down tons and tons and tons of offers to get in the ring? 
Yeah, absolutely. I, I remember uh, Don King mentioning something about it. You know, there is a lot of uh, financial asset in this fight, and um, obviously, um, you know, he had no clue that uh, we promised our mom not to not to get involved in it. And uh, we never fought each other, by the way. Outside, even, even of outside, yeah. outside of the ring, outside of the ring, we did spar with each other, and uh, yeah, yeah. that's what I mean, like 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 sparring. Yeah. We love yeah. we love each other to death, but when two brothers spar with each other, um, it's very emotional. Yeah, because um, it, there is certain competition where you really knock him out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um, but but you know what? Even though we both ended up would have ended up fighting each other, there wouldn't be a winner. Even the winner would be a loser. Right. Like, come on. Yeah, yeah. yeah you always take it's, that with it's, it's, it's the sport. It's not like William's sister, sisters can't play with each other tennis, you know. It's not the same thing. So boxing is about just to eliminate someone who is what, know, cross what, of the ring. One follow-up to that. When you um, lost to uh, Corey Brewster, I believe, and then your brother... Corey Sanders. Corey or, Sanders, I'm sorry. Yeah, or Lemon Brewster, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and then your brother goes in there and kicks his ass... Um, like, it, Corey Sanders. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, isn't that like what? What? What must that be like to have that kind of relationship? Well, you with saw your the brother? emotion in his face when he when they, when he won. It was amazing. It was it was incredible to watch because like it, again from from having brothers myself, it's like when I remember that. Yeah, I remember watching it. You were, the, you were on the side of that. Where you were you were ecstatic. But I started to take away the, yeah, the yeah, answer, no, no, exactly. I, just, that I point. remember, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. wanted to bring it up. Sorry. Yeah, it's just like uh, you know. actually this fight was happening here in Los Angeles at Staples Center, and yeah. Vitaly was fighting Corey Sanders, and he became champion um, after he was fighting against Lennox Lewis yeah. and didn't get the title, which was also happening here in Los Angeles. I was at that fight. Yeah, I saw that fight. So yeah. um, it was it was it was very emotionally. Um, I, I was emotionally attached to this fight. Obviously, not just I wanted to fight Corey Sanders. Um, in those days, I couldn't get the fight due to contracts and no rematch clause in the contract and so on. So my brother ended up fighting for the title, world title. And uh, of course I was happy. I mean, wouldn't you? Of course, it's, 100%. It's, uh, it's something that was amazing and uh, to see him as a champion again. And um, he he've done a good job. It, it was a really tough fight, by the way. Yeah. Really tough fight. Is your brother involved in your ventures with the books and the lectures as well? No, 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 no. My brother is a politician, so he's um, awesome. he he he's a hundred percent. I don't want to say he's a politician because politics. It's like we, we're putting we're putting Vitaly now into the stereotypes, you know, with politicians. Um, he's he's the mayor of city of Kiev, mm -hmm. and does that have really to do anything with the politics? Yes, but in his daily routine, he takes care of people and there are over four million people living in the city of Kiev. Wow. It's a beautiful city with a history over thousand five hundred years and over four million people with zero, nada, unemployment. Wow. wow. So um, even considering the, 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 the political geopolitical crisis with an annexation of Crimea and the war with Russia in the, in the east of the country. So considering these challenges city of key is doing pretty well and uh, vitaly is doing a great job it's challenging yeah um it's not like in boxing ring you see your opponent and uh, it's all honest and straight and the rules in right. politics is a little bit different yeah even though he's a mayor and i wouldn't consider him as a politician because he's not like in parliament and you know making the laws voting for uh left or right um, he, he takes care, his daily routine is basically lots of work and take care of the people of, of their daily routines that they're more comfortable, the transportation, dig, digitalization. I mean, people in Kiev are motivated to pay taxes now. Can you believe this? Who is motivated <laughs> to pay taxes? But they, they are because, right. because uh, SAP gave this amazing system, open <clears throat> budgets. So every person that pays taxes in the city, in the blink of an eye, through through digitalization sees that these hundred dollars for instance that he paid to the budget are landing on the budget and then the person sees where it flows to to build kindergartens and schools and and streets and lights and elevators and water and so and 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 and, and. Mm -hmm. um, so it motivates people to pay taxes which was not the case before yeah, but digitalization made it smart city made the city safer so in may we had 
like Super Bowl for for American football, we had Champions League finals. It's mm-hmm. about soccer. Mm-hmm. I mean, this event is like it's 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 a gigantic event, and we had it in the city of Kiev in May. And the president of the UEFA, mm-hmm. uh, Alexander Safrin, said said this event went without mistakes, without a single mistake. It was perfect. Thank you so much to the city of Kiev, and it was the best compliment America could have. So I'm proud of my brother, of his awesome. job. He's yeah, amazing. No. Um, well, there are guys, challenges. But you guys didn't fight, well. but who's better at chess? Well, I would say, I would say my brother is better in fighting and in playing chess because he actually taught me how to play chess. Oh, wow. yeah, that, yeah, he yeah. taught me. And uh, same as boxing. I was the first sparring partner of my brother. He put the gloves on and he was practicing on me. So I didn't like it much. <laughs> but, you know, it helped him to get better in the ring. So I did my job and my part. And uh, I always get into the same thing. And he's the most challenging guy that I've ever had in my life. He never gets tired of challenging me. Well, look at that. Once again, Vladimir Klitschko, the book is Challenge Management. You can get that on Amazon, like you said. Um, it was an absolute pleasure to have you in the studio, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah, and guys, get the book. I'm, I'll tell you right now, I'm going to be reading this book because yeah, this I'm was a motivating... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, because it, it's a motivating thing what you were talking about, your ideas for the sport of boxing. And I want I can't wait to follow your career much much more of what you're gonna do now now that you've retired from the ring. Thank you once again for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Vladimir Klitschko, ladies and gentlemen.